Ashdo people are often regarded as a bad omen, and for good reason. Apart from being a terrifying apparition, they often cause a great deal of malevolence wherever they reside. Please join me in welcoming the paranormal scholar as we delve into the world of shadow people. But remember, this is a two-part collaboration, and four more excellent stories can be found on their channel. So when this video ends, be sure to follow us over to get all eight. But without further ado, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I was laying in my bed, the room door in front of me wide open and to the left. I could see the room where the front door was. There was an antique cabinet that my father had put lights in that illuminated with a white glow. I started to freak out for no reason and began sweating. I, for some reason, knew shit was about to happen and I was about to witness something. And about five minutes later, laying hot in sweat, I saw it. There was a door in the back of the room, with the front door. A black, outlined humanoid figure walks out, mildly staticky looking. It takes a few steps towards the front door and then stops, does a military like turn facing me, and at this point I'm freaking the shit out, eyes wide. It walks into my room and stops beside my bed, does one more military turn facing me. At that point, I figured I had nothing to lose. I noped out of my room and ran through the thing, ran upstairs to my parents' bedroom and knocked furiously at the door waiting for them to let me in. My eyes focused on the stairs, making sure that the thing was not following me. Nothing. I slept with my parents for the next few nights. It was one of the scariest things to happen to me as a child. A short time after that encounter, I began to settle down and my thoughts were no longer fearful. I don't usually tell it to a lot of people. The only people who know are the others involved and a handful of friends. It's always haunted us. And although we've tried to find anything out about it, nothing seems to fit. There's some backstory I feel is necessary, but bear with me since it escalated pretty quickly. I live in a small town in central Wisconsin, and it's always been the kind of place where kids would run around in small packs until midnight or later, since your neighbors were typically like extended family. You have to understand first off, that we all grew up in the country surrounded by woods. We knew the land, and we knew the wildlife of the area. What we saw was no animal. Like I said, it wasn't uncommon for kids to stay out until 2 or 3 in the morning around my home. It was about that late, and 6 of us, including myself, were still playing ghosts in the graveyard. We were playing in the wood lot behind Becky and Andy's house. And if you're unfamiliar with the game, you hide and then try to reach a safe point without being tagged. I'm a dark-skinned girl with crazy brown hair, so it was always easy for me to hide in the underbrush of the forest since I blended in well. I went over by the fence near the neighbor's property line and hid in the small ditch by the posts. It was pretty isolated, but I could still hear Becky trying to find people in the distance. I was laying there for a good 10 to 15 minutes when I heard the crunching of footsteps a few feet away from me. It was strange, since I was listening carefully for Becky, and I hadn't heard anyone walking anywhere around me before that moment. I figured someone might have been up a tree and jumped down, but when I looked up, it wasn't anyone. There were these two humanoid beings, seemingly made of shadow and a lot taller than any person I'd ever met. They had to be around eight feet, since their heads reached almost past the lower boughs of the pines. They had white faces, with lips but no nose, and their eyes were just dark, like holes, without lids. 
Even more frightening than their appearance was the fact that they had made no other sounds. Anyone who has lived in a forest before knows that when it's quiet, it's quiet. You hear everything, even your own heartbeat. They didn't breathe. There was no shifting sounds. They were just there. They weren't moving, and being a kid, I still thought these things had to be people. They just stood there, staring at me like they were waiting for me to do something. I was really stupid, and I should have just ran, screaming as soon as I saw them. But I was too scared to move. I remember it vividly, and I got up the courage and asked them, Hello? And when that got no response, I repeated myself more timidly. I've gone through a lot of stuff in my life, but I've never been so scared as I was right then. Then there was this moment, like some weird buzz in the air where I just knew they were talking. I can't really explain it, but it's like the feeling you get when two magnets try to touch each other. They were talking. I just didn't know what about. Suddenly, they started fighting with one another. It was synchronized, with both of them reaching and grabbing at each other at the same time. But there was still no sound. It was like someone had muted the television, except for the movement they caused on the ground. I booked it after that. I was crying hysterically and calling out for help. Anyone who knows me knows that I don't do that. I don't cry or get overtly emotional. I'm the rock that everyone else goes to in a crisis situation. I was the oldest in our friendship group besides Andy, who was Becky's older brother and not really a friend. And I had practically raised some of these kids, even though I was only 13. I don't usually get scared, but I was terrified then. Of course, Becky came running, and Nathan followed since he had already been caught. They tried to ask me what was going on, but I could barely get it out. Seeing them gave me back some courage though, and I called out for Greg and Mary to get back to the house. Mary came back running from the church lot down the street. She was crying because she had seen them too, and was shaking. We were grouped up by the back porch when we heard Greg scream. He came out to us, and his arm was scratched and bleeding. He said he didn't know what happened, but something tried to grab him. We ran inside and woke up Andy. Becky locked all the doors, and although I felt a bit better inside, I was still freaking out since these kids were still in danger. Of course, Andy and Nathan weren't all that quick to believe us. Andy because he was skeptical, and Nathan because he was scared. Like Becky though, Andy took it more seriously when he saw how shaken up I was. Like I said, I am not the one to get shaken up. The gun case was locked since Becky and Andy's parents were out of town, but they both played baseball and grabbed their bats. I didn't want to go back out there, but Andy said I needed to show him where they were. Becky went with me and stayed behind as I walked them back to the fence, but they had disappeared. It was a relief, but when we got back inside and looked outside the windows, we could see more of them staring at us from the edge of the woods. Their white faces were bright in the dark. All of us just huddled up in the living room, terrified. We were there for a couple of hours, and Mary kept trying to get me to take her home. She was still crying and worked up, and although I wanted to get her home, she was about a mile away and would have to go on foot. It was getting close to 4am though, and my mother called, screaming at me to get home before hanging up. I remember we went to the garage together, and just looked out. We didn't see them, but none of us were certain that meant that they weren't there. Nathan and Greg were the closest besides me. They both booked it, and I could see Greg make it to his driveway in the distance. It was lighter out, and I had somewhat recovered. I told Becky to go back inside, and made the executive decision to walk Mary home. Andy and Becky didn't want to let us go, but I was older and felt responsible for her. Andy made me take his bat though. We both ended up running for a while, but I wasn't the fastest person to begin with, and she was exhausted. It took us a good 20 minutes to get back to her apartment. 
We got there, and then I walked back alone without incident. I don't think we ever played in the woods again after that. Nathan moved away, Becky and Andy became jerks, so the only two I'm still close to are Mary and Greg. It took a while and honestly I had thought I had imagined the whole thing up. About a month later though, I had Mary and Greg sleep over, and I brought it up. They remembered it, and Greg showed me the scar on his arm. Mary told me that they'd been in the small woods behind her house a couple of times since then, like they were keeping watch. I thought this was crazy, but then hearing them confirm everything kind of made me wish I was. I only saw them once or twice after that myself. Like Mary's experience, it felt like they were keeping watch more than anything else. What's weird is that after this happened, I felt more connected to everything around me. I thought ESP, ghosts and all of that stuff was just people being scared, sick or insane. But now that I've had a taste of it for myself, it was like I couldn't go back. My sister went to see a psychic later and dragged me with her. The woman we saw, and every other one I've met since, always tells me I was touched by something and that I was special. Again, I thought it was nonsense but I started doing fake fortunes at summer camps since I figured I could copy what they did. It wasn't even with tarot cards, just a regular deck of cards or reading their hands. I would see images in my head, brush it off as imagination, and then when I described them to the people I was reading, they all seemed completely shocked and would tell me how it was true. This wasn't that horoscope stuff either. You know how you can say things that apply to anybody. No. I saw a boy in a blue jacket next to a red pickup truck, crying on the ice, and the girl told me about how her little brother had broken his ankle. I would pick cards, seemingly at random from the deck, and make up some rubbish about how this meant there was a family conflict between this girl, a sibling, and some guy in a baseball cap, only for them to get mad and ask me who told them about it. It freaked me out, and so I stopped until last year when I went to college and met my friend Christina, who was the president of the Pagan Forum and did her own divination. I remember telling her about the shadow people and the weird stuff that happened afterwards. She helped me figure out how to use my gifts, and I've been helping people ever since. I've got stronger, and now that I have experience, I can tell that when I read a person, it's that same magnetic sensation as those things had when they were talking. I can't say for sure, and I know this whole thing is really hard to believe, but I think that whatever came after us that night left something behind. I saw a shadow person once. I didn't know that's what they were called until much later. I was living in a house in Laguna Beach that had been there since the 1920s. In its history, it had been a speakeasy, a brothel, and a house for smuggling illegal immigrants. One day, my new wife and I were having an argument. I can't even recall what it was about. She walked down the block to get a cup of coffee and cool off, and I was alone in the house. The way the place was built was incredibly haphazard. There was a bedroom and a living room on one side, then a bathroom with two entrances on the other side. From my bedroom, I could see across the hall into the bathroom, then through the bathroom and look down the other hall. I was standing at my dresser and I just noticed movement out of the corner of my eye. I looked down there and there it was. Honest to God, this gives me goosebumps just remembering it 17 years later. It was a black figure. It was about three feet tall, and it was only vaguely humanoid. It looked like black scribbles, as if someone had scribbled a human shape. But the scribbles moved, like electricity arcing. That's the best way I can describe it. There was no sound that I could remember. I distinctly remember that when I saw it, I wasn't afraid. I was just confused. Then it noticed me looking at it. I can't say it turned around. It just focused on me, I suppose. And then I was scared. 
I didn't move, I didn't scream, nothing. I was just frozen. Because at that moment, it came at me. It rushed down the hallway towards me. I have no idea what it intended, but as soon as it entered the bathroom, the door closed and just slammed shut by itself. I screamed. I yelled for my wife, but she wasn't home. I went outside into the daylight and didn't go back in until she got home about 10 minutes later. I don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe I saw something supernatural, but I know I saw something. I just don't know what that something was. I've always had abilities. As a child, the dead would speak to me. I witnessed frightening entities and was physically affected by them. I started telling my parents about what I'd see and who I'd speak to from a young age. Being quite religious, they grew ever more concerned whenever I would bring it up. You may think me insane, but I'm accustomed to this. In 1997, my parents had a church elder come to our house to exercise any evil that encompassed me and begged God to shut the door I found to the spiritual world. I was angry. I never asked for this or sought it out. However, they did not see it this way. They believed that this ability was malignant and needed to be purged as it was ungodly. I made them believe that it had worked by no longer sharing my experiences with my parents. I grew to resent them because of the lack of compassion and understanding they showed me. After college and a failed marriage to an abusive man and family, I was dirt broke. I had school loans, lawyers and legal fees and moving debts from escaping the living horror that was my life. I had no one to turn to. My overly religious family were not something I wanted to put up with and my ex-husband had left me battered and bruised after the physical assaults from him and his family. I didn't want to be alone, so I moved in with a co-worker. I loved my job, but my career in social services did not pay well by any means. My friend and then roommate was not a believer in the paranormal. She believed in herself and her next romantic conquest, and I love her all the more for it. Shortly after moving into our shared house in an old, semi-rural Phoenix area, we began to have strange experiences. There would be occasions when I would hear voices coming from another room or down the hallway when I was alone in the house. The first time it happened, I was terrified, and when I went to investigate the sound's origin, there would be nothing and no one there. These muffled conversations did not cease and I even started seeing shadow people. From the corner of my eye on occasion, I'd see a shadow pass along the ground or across a wall. I was accustomed to this, however, something about that house or the spirits residing there made me nervous. There was a darkness that consumed the house, and I could sense its sinister nature. There would be several times when my roommate would ask if I had moved things, or entered her room at night and just stare at her from a corner or persistently leave the door unlocked. The answer to all of her questions was of course no. At one point, she awoke me in the middle of the night, shaking. She asked me to burn sage and explained that she had been having weird dreams of a man with a skull face holding her down and sucking out her soul. She also stated that she knew she was awake but the entity was preventing her from moving. When she tried to repel him, all the light bulbs in the room exploded. I could tell she was terrified, as she didn't want to sleep in her room. She was normally a strong, fearless person, but this, this was too much for her. The next day, I burnt sage and salted our entire house. I attempted to tell the energy it was not welcome and had no power here. Nonetheless, it persisted. It got to the point where I would just collect my dog and stay at my boyfriend's house because of the intense activity. Whatever was in there was powerful, and I had no idea how to be rid of it. My roommate started burning incense when I wasn't home because the experiences were growing so frequent. Not even three weeks later, I was on holiday with my boyfriend when my roommate called. She was crying 
because our 16-year-old neighbor had murdered some of his siblings, including a baby. The others were wounded, but had sought help. I moved out the next week. I could feel the depression like a heavy blanket. She continues to live in our house. She still has horrible dreams, and at 28 was extremely healthy, but now has two horribly debilitating diseases. It may all be a coincidence, but maybe it's all because evil truly rules that neighborhood. Whatever lives there is truly insidious, and I am all the happier to be rid of it.